Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be looking at Kitty Hawk's SU30 SM Flanker H. Kitty Hawk are no longer around as a brand, so it's quite hard to get a hold of this kit, but let's see what they had to offer when they were producing kits. I hope you enjoy, and let's get into it. So the instructions dictate that this kit should be begun in the cockpit, specifically with the ejection seats. I found this quite interesting as on most jets that I've built it has been usually a model of a Martin Baker ejection seat, however this is a Soviet ejection seat, so the shapes and everything are a little bit different. However, the thing that isn't different is the general build up and construction of the seats. It uses the quite generic um, sort of assembly where it uses the back of the seat or the frame of the seat as sort of your base and every all the sub assemblies kind of snaps onto there. It's a very basic seat but it, does, it definitely does feature some quite nice details which will be picked out later on. Although the details are quite nice, Kitty Hawk are very generous and offer a photo etch fret as standard in the kit. It features quite a few different elements of photo etch, including some grills for a back of the aircraft and also some of the antennas and stuff. Uh, also, some of the, some of the antennas are unusable as they just don't look correct. But one of the good things about them is that it offers seat belts. This was my first time using photo etch seat belts, however after doing a little bit of research it seemed that what you had to do was stick it on at a base point using, you don't have to use, but using a super glue. I used VMS's super glue. And then what you want to try and do is fold them into a shape which kind of simulates a fabric. So this means lots of folds, lots of creases, lots of crinkles, so that when they're painted up they don't look like a piece of metal. So the SU-30 is a tandem, I guess, cockpit, so it has two seats, so I had two chances to practice with this. The one on the right, which I just dropped, was my first attempt, and the one on the left was my second attempt. The second attempt was far better than the first attempt, but I had to make do. It was then time to start the bit of detail painting. Both seats were initially given a coat of Vallejo's black primer, and then I'm picking out some details now with some olive drab and also some buff paint. The buckles on the seat belts and other elements of the seat were also picked out using a variety of colours like reds, whites and silvers. And also here you can see me just doing a little bit of highlight painting on the black headrest as just base black looked a little bit off. Here you can see all the detail painted seats. As I felt that the ejection seats looked a little bit underwhelming I gave them a satin varnish and then I came in with an AK wash. Uh, this just gives some depth perception and you know fills in a couple of different shades to it and just makes it look a bit more believable. For the AK wash it was a dark grey or dark browny colour for the um, general part of the seat and then the upper headrest which was black I used a white wash which I had made myself just using some white oil paints and white spirit. This was then rubbed off as any access just looked a little bit weird didn't it? I've recently started using Tamiya's cotton buds and my god are they good. So their sort of selling point is the fact that they are really tightly woven so they won't disintegrate as easily as some other ones and they are absolutely brilliant for really really fine removal of any oil paint. So I'd recommend at least getting one pack to see what you think of them. Turning our attention back to what's happening on screen, you could see me filling in and building up two walls which go in the cockpit. You also saw me fill in an ejection pin with some VMS superglue. Ejection pins and general mould quality on this kit is um, it's a mixed bag. It reminds me a lot of a Revel kit and you will see in just a couple clips what I mean. So with the walls all built up they can be fitted into the rather large cockpit. I was quite actually taken away by the sheer size of this cockpit and the sheer size of the flanker itself. Uh, comparing it to an F-16 uh, in the same scale, it, it just it dwarfs it. It is incredible. So a couple more elements are fitted to the cockpit. This includes stuff like the rudder pedals, some of the uh, instrument or control instruments which go on the side and just generally making the cockpit a lot more busy. Most of these items are very well moulded, um, you know, nice crisp details which makes it easy for detail painting, which I will show you later in the video. 
but it's a nice quite simple construction at the moment this does change though later on in the build so there are some photo etch sort of i guess they're like almost restraints that go on your rudder pedals and they almost lock your your foot on the rudder pedals these unfortunately just did not fit at all on the rudder pedal so i think someone might have done a slight mismeasurement at kitty hawk when they were trying to design these i think that's just the general theme of this kit it's just inaccuracies in many many places of the kit why that is i'm not too sure maybe it was a rushed kit i'm not too sure about the timeline of when this was put into development and when it actually came out however it seems like a very rushed kit and like not a lot of thought was put into it which is a real shame so the instrument panels are then dry fitted into the um build up and then it is all primed up so the Russian cockpits have a very special blue colour to them and I believe this blue colour was actually meant to um, calm the pilots when they are in there. Apparently the blue is a calming colour compared to a grey or a black that can be commonly seen in NATO jets. If this is true, who knows, but I believe that is a reasoning behind it. This was sprayed on at about 30 psi with my Harder and Steenbeck Evolution 0.3 nozzle. After that I could then remove the dry fitted contro uh, control and instrument panels and then have them detail painted. I used a variety of colours here, reds, blacks, whites, silvers, even a couple of greens and yellows in there and here was the final result. I think there's a lot, a lot of time which was spent on this, about three hours of detail painting, uh, <laughs> whereas you could have just used the supplied de decal. However. It felt wrong to as the, the moulded detail was so good and I think this beats any decal. So I can then fit the ejection seats into the cockpit and this really makes the cockpit look a lot more busy. The photo etch seat belts really were a good addition. I think I'll have to try to use them more in the future because I definitely have a couple more fast jet builds coming up and I'm sure that cockpit will look a little bit empty without them. So the final thing that I had to do before the cockpit was completed was to fit the... Um, the the dashboard i don't know i feel like dashboard is a complete wrong thing to say however it's the element which goes between the two ejection seats and it has a little um heads up display on it for for the uh, for the person in the back please someone tell me what it's called because i don't want to keep on calling it a dashboard <laughs> thank you so a big issue which i found with this kit were the instructions continuously mislabeled parts there were always the just the wrong number and this is when dry fitting really is so important because I would dry fit a part realize it didn't fit and then I would have to go and find the alternative part on about six sprues worth of parts it, it, it did become quite tedious at some point so this kit is definitely not for the faint of heart so I'll start ranting just for a second and tell you what's happening on screen. I'm building up one section of the air intake slash exhaust section. It's definitely quite a complicated uh, build up with the exhausts and also the intakes. It's a lot of slotting and fitting and just different parts all coming together. So when I was talking about build quality and the ejection pins, this is what I meant. Look at the state of these um, exhausts. These will have to be cleaned up. I used a pair of my uh, pincers and pretty much a lot of sandpaper and it started to look a bit better. I just wanted to get the, mo the majority of the material out of the way as it was going to cause an awful lot of fit issues. There are fit issues already but this was just going to cause even more fit issues. Once they were all out of the way it, it goes together, not brilliantly. There's a lot of sanding and trimming which is required but you will get it in there, just be patient. Uh, Kitty Hawk do offer a complete, like a quite a detailed representation of the engine as the um, on the main fuselage, it allows you to have pa certain panels open, which would show you all of these internals. However, I opted not to do that purely because I was incredibly worried about the fit issues here. Uh, I, I just lost confidence with um, with the kit at this point, so I didn't want to take any risks. I found it incredibly hard to find any reference images of the uh, SU-30's engine, so I had no real clue for colour, so I just kind of 
took a stab in the dark and this is what I came up with just doing a bit of uh, sponge chipping and painting the uh, tips of the uh, fan blades in a um, in a metallic color to do a little bit of weathering on the exhaust um, output I was just going to use some burnt umber and also I believe it's called like it's a noir color or pretty much just a black color what I did is I dotted a couple of them got my flat head um, paintbrush out it was slightly dampened in white spirit and then I would just drag it back in the direction of airflow. This just added a, a, a nice amount of weathering, not too harsh, but you know, enough to create a little bit of interest. I thought it came out quite nicely and it was it was built up using quite a few different colours. So as I said, the burnt umber, the blacks, but then also a couple of peach colours in there as well, just to build it up, give it a bit more texture. So as you can see on screen, here I am just fitting those two uh, exhaust uh, slash intake parts which I had built earlier. They go in with relative ease with some nice location tabs. This was one of the <laughs> better engineered pieces of the kit. Uh, and then the engine which I just painted can slot into there as can be seen. This part was okay. It was okay, you know, not too bad and relatively secure. So drifting away from the intakes, I then thought it was a good idea to build up the gear bay or wheel well. These follow a very generic sort of build up as you can be seen on most kits where you have a base plate which almost acts, acts as a little bit of a jig for the rest of the parts. So Kitty Hawk managed to do this quite well indeed. And there is sufficient detail. I thought you wouldn't really want any more detail here. However, there's definitely room to increase that so on to another sub assembly this time i'm looking at the uh, it's the rear portion of the fuselage i believe it's actually the speed brake or the air brake and this just slots onto the underside of the fuselage or the underside part of the fuselage it's then time to start building and bringing sub assemblies and putting them onto the actual fuselage uh, here you can see me putting on the front gear bay and also the cockpit sub assembly that slots in very nicely it was cemented in just using some tamiya extra thin cement and the su30 features some canards as you saw i throw on the floor as i thought the mechanism was absolutely horrendous so i left them out and i will show you what i did with them in a second so with all sub assemblies secured in place i then um join the two fuselages together this was um a battle to say the least as you can see there's a lot a lot of uh, masking tape holding this in place and I actually then left this uh, for about a day just to let all the glue everything settle and then I started to uh, start filling in a couple of the seams and gaps mainly using VMS's uh, super glue CA super glue purely because it was um, I thought it would add to the strength whereas if I used Vallejo's putty you know that thing stretches and all sorts of stuff anyway as you can see my hack for the canards was pretty much just to cut off the front bit and then just almost use it as a pin and stuff it in there once again using super glue to hopefully provide some more strength it worked semi well however i did knock it off once or twice and then it had to be super glued back on so the nose construction um is pretty simple i don't know why it was done in two parts like this uh but you know it kind of worked a couple of fit issues again uh, but to sort out the fit issues here I think I did use Vallejo's uh, putty purely because it, it you know it was such a big gap that if I use super glue there it, it has the potential to like sort of crack um, so I thought using putty would probably be a better option there and it seemed to work okay here you can see what I was talking about when I came to when I was talking about all the covers and stuff for the engines. These slot in okay, definitely not Tamiya sort of slotting in, but they slot in with a little bit of persuasion. So the wings of my kit were actually very nicely warped. I mean, look at the state of that. And also, I don't know if it was just my kit or something. However, do not drill out holes for any of the pylons as there are no weapons included or any ordnance included on this kit which I found incredibly annoying purely because on the box art it shows it with uh, you know a couple of targeting pods a couple of missiles and all that sort of stuff and I thought oh that would look sick and it doesn't include them which is a real shame. 
so you might have seen however the wings actually did need quite a lot of super glue to ensure a, quite a smooth fit so it was a lot of sanding and a lot of priming to make sure it looked okay but after that was done I then moved on to looking at the front bit of the intakes so both of my intakes were nicely warped as you can see on screen so make sure you have some clamps nearby so you can have that sorted and then when I put them onto the plane they didn't fit correctly there was a lovely huge probably about two millimeter gap at the rear so to sort that back out I got Vallejo's putty back out and that was the absolute best I could do. It wasn't flawless, but I thought I'll have a slight dip in it rather than, you know, spend probably about five or six hours trying to sort it out. And then even more filling was then required when it came on to the resin exhaust that was supplied in the kit. Uh, the, even after doing a lot of sanding and filing down, I couldn't get it perfect. So I kind of accepted defeat there and just used more putty. Moving on, uh, the front edge of the wing was actually quite nicely fitted um, and also the rear flapper on was also quite good indeed. However, to put them in that down position, you kind of have to cut off every single uh, sort of pin that would go into the wing to hold it and you kind of have to butt joint it, which definitely isn't brilliant, but it works, so I can't really knock it. Moving on to looking at the horizontal stabilizers, <laughs> these were actually well engineered, they had a nice big pin which would slot into a corresponding place on the fuselage, however I was soon then brought down by an inadequate, um, an inadequ inadequately sized location tab for the uh, pretty big vertical stabilizers so I had to do a bit of filling and everything there to make sure that was okay. For the masking off of the canopies, I used a combination of masking tape and also masking fluid. I didn't buy any masks, these were all just done by using my toothpick method. If you've watched previous videos on the channel, I'm sure you'll know all about that. Uh, it's you know it just saves a couple of pounds rather than buying an Edward mask set or anything and it, it turns out okay in the end and with the canopy on it was then a completed assembly I'd make sure to go over uh, certain areas which I was working on with primer just to ensure that I was somewhat happy with how it looked of course I wasn't completely happy but it was the best that I thought I could physically do so for priming, I'm using Vallejo's primer, thinned 50-50, and then I'm spraying at about 24, I believe, 24-25 PSI, and this seemed to work okay, with the exception of one or two little splutters, but I believe that's just because my airbrush wasn't cleaned brilliantly. So after it was all primed, it gave me a really nice base to do some mottling. I haven't done mottling for a while, however, I thought this was a pretty good base to do so. So what mottling is, is pretty much just creating tonal variations on the underlying paint surface so that the top paint and your final paint coat has lots of tonal variation and looks a little bit more visually interesting. So to do mottling, what you need to do is you need to have your air pressure at maybe 20 psi, a bit lower than usual, and then you pretty much just do lots and lots of random panel uh, random sort of squiggles in between panel lines. However, I did not mottle on the underside. Instead, I wanted to use some of these sort of mottling masks that I got. Mottling stencils is probably a better word. Uh, just to see what they would look like as the underside was going to be one color uh, rather than the tritone camo which is featured on top. So here you can see the final results. The mottling wasn't incredibly neat, but it, I thought it would do. And you know, it wasn't too harsh. So onto the tri -tech camo. I believe there is a pale gray, an air superior superiority blue, and also another gray blue color, which I can't remember the name of. However, all of these are actually sold in a uh, paint set by Ammo. Uh, ammo mig i always really use ammo mig as my colors as i get on best with them so i'm sure that you can find the paint set online with relative ease when it comes to spraying my ammo mig paints i like to spray it around about 30 psi as this just gives me the best full finish um, and i use my harder and steambeck evolution 0.4 nozzle uh, <laughs> nozzle for this 
So when it comes to me actually freehanding this camo, I thought it was the best idea purely because upon looking at some reference images, these Russian jets uh, seem to have quite a loose camo. By loose, I mean it has quite a soft edge. So I, I, I thought I could replicate that better by freehanding rather than masking it off. And also I don't really like masking stuff. So if I have an excuse to freehand, I sure will take it. So to ensure that I don't completely lose the mortal effect which lies uh, beneath the paint, I make sure not to go too heavy on the coats. It's more layering the coats with a slight, slightly lighter, uh, just so you can preserve some of that effect and really show off the f sort of faded and tonal variation paint which uh, lies above. I've said it before and I will say it again when you are doing this sort of painting it is always a good idea to every so often just stop and just walk to the other side of your room and look at the model. This just really helps to sort of understand if you've gone too far with your modeling, do you need to do more with your modeling and just help you understand the model in different lighting situations. It's definitely helped me out a couple of times be more satisfied with the final result. So also interestingly I personally thought going into this build that most Flankers are always using very vibrant blues and as you can see on screen these are not vibrant blues these are very very dark and grey but after doing some research and actually referring to the, the paint scheme provided um, it's, it's a there's a different camouflage it's much more pale uh, so it's, it's definitely quite interesting to see because I mean I never knew I thought they were all this really vibrant blue colour but there you go learn something new every day. After all of the camouflage was done and the underside was sprayed in that air superiority blue, I then masked off the incredibly complex hot section. It was given a coat of AK's Extreme Metal uh, Aluminium, I believe. I believe I went with aluminium as the base coat uh, and then I built it up with other colours as you will see in a second. So as you can see, the ammo MIG paints are brilliant but they are acrylic which makes them very prone to... Um, you know ripping off when you're taking off your masking tape as you can see in the left hand side of your screen but that was all touched up later on in the um, video and it only took about 20 seconds so the first thing that I wanted to do with the hot section was just put a, diff a few different types of metals on there so here I am distinguishing two different shades of metal on the rear portion of the exhaust I believe I'm using ammo MIGs, um, I think this is gun metal just to give a darker tone and then I sectioned off a couple of the panels and gave them a burnt umber, uh, not a burnt umber, sorry, a burnt iron colour. These were then all blended in using AK's aluminium again purely because when it's left like this it looks far too harsh and too like nothing like the real thing. So if it does look too harsh the best thing to do is then blend it back in using your original colour. Uh, I've used this technique before in my Phantom video, if you haven't watched that, that is on my channel and I do once again quite an in-depth explanation of how I do all my hot sections on there. This one's definitely a different hot section, however techniques definitely can be cross-referenced across different subjects. So before I do all the oil work to simulate all the heat damage and all this sort of stuff, I gave it VMS's satin varnish. I didn't want to do a gloss varnish as that doesn't let the oil stick as much to the paint, so a satin is more desirable. So the first thing to do was to distinguish some blue colours on certain sections and this was done just by dabbing one or two little dots and then dragging it with my um, flathead sort of brush just to give um, a, a quite a general tone as it didn't seem to be very patchy, it seemed to be quite continuous sort of colours. This technique was then continued across quite a lot of the hot section but just using different colours and also using different brushes to get different effects. So if I wanted a bit more of a patchy and a more grimy look I would use my fat head and sort of rounder brush diluted in white spirit and that would become a bit more patchy and a bit more grimy looking whereas if I wanted a continuous colour then I would use my flat head as you can see on this clip here. So a really good tip that I have for you is just to make sure you have loads of reference images before you do something very complex like this. 
I spent about 10 minutes just finding different angles, different pictures, just looking at different colors that I used, what it looks like from different angles. And generally the main colors I found were blues and this sort of burnt umber color. There were a couple of purples and stuff in there, but I, I thought it would be easier just to use a couple of blues and a couple of browns as they were a color which I was more used to using and something which I knew would look quite good on contrasting to these metals. So these techniques were carried out throughout the whole hot section. Um, my favorite technique to do is probably this stipple effect as you can see on screen as it just gives this really grimy and sort of worn appearance which looks really quite um, authentic when you look at some reference photos but I'll let you guys be the judges of that. I won't keep on hyping up my own work. So this sort of effect and everything was then continued on the underside of the hot section as well as I didn't and I didn't want to film it just because I thought we've already spent about three minutes looking at it here so what's the point in doing it again so I then used a very similar method with using the different tones of metallic paints uh, on the gun section I'm not too sure why this uh, you know this part of the the place is so metallic like there's so many panels which are metallic it seems almost a bit overkill so if anyone knows a reasoning for this I'm really actually interested about that and I couldn't seem to find an answer on the internet so please do let me know in the comments down below so the final things to do was pretty much just do the gear and there were no ordnance as I already talked about so I didn't really have to worry about that I didn't film this purely because it was very very simple uh, there wasn't really much to film or talk about and it, I don't know I was just running out of mojo for this kit after all of the fit issues and everything and I wanted to get it done uh, another thing which almost sent me over the edge were the decals they were not good at all they were <laughs> they were really really thick yet really really fragile so not too sure what's happened there but luckily I didn't really have too many to put onto the um, model as the scheme only needed a couple of stars and a couple of numbers and everything like that so after that I gave the entire model a satin uh, varnish this was by VMS you saw me use it earlier in the build and then it was time to take the masking tape off of the canopies and then cement them in place the canopies didn't fit brilliantly but that was just pretty much expected at this point in the build uh, but I tried my best to get them to fit properly. And with that, that was the build complete. So I hope you've enjoyed my take on a rather challenging kit. I don't think I'll be doing another Kitty Hawk kit in a hurry. Uh, but anyway, I hope you enjoy the final photos and I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, and I will see you in the next one guys. So bye bye.